It isn't a common cold. The confusion is that about 10 to 30 percent of the common colds that you and I and everyone else get during a season happen to be a coronavirus. But a certain subset of coronaviruses can cause extremely serious disease. They did it with SARS, they did it with MERS, and now they're doing it here with the novel coronavirus. The reason it's serious is that a question that was asked by Dr. Harris is that the mortality of this is multiple times what seasonal flu is. So seasonal flu spreads widely. The mortality is 0.1%. Right now in China, the mortality for this particular infection is the latest report was 3 to 4%. It might be a little bit less. It isn't a cold. It's very interesting that most of the of the common colds have upper respiratory infections. This virus, not to get too technical, the component of the virus that binds to a receptor in the body to allow it to infect, those receptors are rich in the lung. That's the problem. It binds to it. So a person can present no sneezing, no sinusitis, fever, shortness of breath, you do a chest x-ray and you have pulmonary infiltrates. That's not the common cold. So the public health ways to avoid getting coronavirus are very similar to those to avoid influenza. And that is particularly as simplistic as it sounds, washing your hands as frequently as you can. One of the problems with respiratory borne diseases is that they are spread either by droplets, gross droplets, someone coughs or sneezes on you, or even a bit of aerosolized where you can be sitting next to someone very closely and you don't cough and sneeze, but the virus can aerosolize it. So what it is, it will get in through a mucosal surface that could either be your nose, your mouth, or even your eye. The reason for washing your hands is that people often do the wrong thing. That's why you hear us say cough into the crook of your elbow. Because people sometimes go like this or blow their nose. They'll shake hands with you, touch a doorknob, 15 minutes later you come by and do that then you touch your face and that's how you get it so that's the way that's the first thing secondly incubation period quarantine the incubation period the median time from when you get exposed to you get in uh, clinical symptoms is about five five point two days that's the median the range is somewhere between two and fourteen fourteen is much much more the outer limit so when someone is suspected of being exposed, they either self-isolate or they get actually institutional quarantine for four days. But you could have... 14 could have, days, 14. Have, the things that we're doing right now in the form of interventions are in the arena of vaccines and in therapeutics. I predicted that we would be about two to three months to go into phase one trials. And I think we're going to beat that. I think we'll be in in probably about six weeks which as a matter of fact will be the fastest that anyone ever has gone from the identification of a sequence into a phase one trial of any vaccine that's ever been done. That's the good news. The sobering news is that since vaccines are given to normal individuals, what is paramount is safety and whether or not it works. So we'll do a phase one trial. We'll do it in a number of our centers, including our center at the NIH. That will take about three to four months and then if successful, which I believe it will be, there's no reason to believe it won't be safe, we'll go into what's called a phase two trial. The phase one trial is 45 individuals. Phase two trials are hundreds, if not a couple of thousand individuals. It would take then about a year to year and a half to be fully confident that we would have a vaccine that would be able to protect the American people. And so although the good news is we did it fast, the bad news is that the reality of vaccinology means this is not going to be something we're going to have tomorrow. Well, the standard approach when you have a vaccine, for example, for influenza, when you have limited vaccines, uh, you give it to the most vulnerable. And the most vulnerable clearly are the elderly and those with underlying conditions. And those generally are heart disease, chronic lung disease, kidney, diabetes, and obesity. Or those who are immunosuppressive drugs who might have an underlying cancer. And so we're, we're, we're 18 months or so away from that. Um, Probably. Least. 
Uh, the other thing that's important um, is that the healthcare workers and those who are the frontline responders, because mm -hmm. those are the ones in every disease we know that are the most vulnerable. In fact, if you look in China, the people who were most vulnerable before they had good PPEs were the healthcare providers.